point. Uh, but I'm uh, super excited to, to be here today. As mentioned, my name is Matthew Glick. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Gipper. I'll go into Gipper in, in just a moment, but I think as of today, we're officially uh, official partners of Eastcom. I actually went to school in the Northeast. Um, I'm from the West Coast originally, but went to Colgate University where I played soccer. Very familiar with um, the schools in the Northeast. A lot of friends that went there. So really excited to, to be a partner and a sponsor um, of this talk as well, um, specifically. Um, for background on Gipper, if you're not familiar with our platform, um, Gipper enables athletic departments to create professional branded content for their social media channels, but in seconds on any device and without needing any sort of design experience whatsoever. And when I'm talking about like professional branded content, I'm talking about all of that content that you see on social media, you're likely already producing it yourself in some way, shape or form, game day graphics, score updates, awards, any sort of visual content. Our platform enables anyone within an athletic department to create on brand content at a really high level, but again, in seconds on any device and without needing any sort of design experience. So um, in 2021, heading into 2022, content demands are at an all time high. Every team, every program wants to be um, represented and have tons of content shared with them. And as you all know, as SIDs, that can be a very, very difficult task. And so our platform makes that easy for you or anyone on your staff. So I thought I'd just you know, share my screen and show you a few examples and show you how it works. But I do want to mention, as part of our sponsorship and our partnership, um, you are um, able to get a discount off all of our plans. Um, you'll get 10% off. There's a code here. You can go to gogipper.com backslash Eastcom. No dash there, just backslash Eastcom. And you can access that code if purchasing by credit card, or you can contact us and our team and we can apply it for you. But I just want to show you exactly what I mean when I'm talking about this content. So this is our Twitter page. Uh, we're used by over a thousand SIDs, um, ADs, and, you know, other athletic administrators and staff from middle school programs all the way up to NCAA Division I athletics. And this is our Twitter account where we retweet schools who are using the platform. So you can see some actual examples of content made really easily using Gipper. And the idea is you can access a whole range of ready-made templates. We have over 500 and adding new templates every week. And you can customize them to your program's branding, just like you see in these examples here. So again, just a few minutes, I want to click over to the actual platform and show you a super abbreviated demo. So this is Gipper on my computer. I have Chrome up right now, um, but Gipper works on any device and any browser. You can use it on the sidelines on your phone. Um, this is what's called the template dashboard on Gipper. This is where you can find a range of ready-made templates for all your different needs. And you can scroll through and browse categories or search by name or keyword. So you could search game day as an example, or you could browse the different categories. And we have things like athletic packs where there's all different types of templates, but with a consistent look and feel that you can then further customize to your branding. So I click through these different packs, sticks, wave, torn. You can see this torn paper look and feel to all of the content. We have motion templates, video templates, sports specific content, everything that you can imagine as an athletic program. And as I mentioned, you can customize um, the content to your needs, and we add new templates on a weekly basis. But I'll show you a really quick example. I'm going to type in game day here, and I'm going to scroll down and show you how you can customize one of these templates um, to your branding in just a few clicks. So I'm going to click open this game day template, and you'll see that it opens up, and in the top left, it says default. On the left side here is what's called the editing section. This is where most of the customization takes place. I have just like two minutes here, so I just want to run through it really quickly. Um, you can plug in your own photos, logos, or videos. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in a football photo that I have stored within my Gipper account in what's called your gallery. That's where you can store and organize all of your media. You'll see it drops right in. I can then go and put in a background photo. So I'm actually just going to use that same photo in the background field. I can then plug in a texture if I want, but I'll leave that. I'll drop in my uh, stock program logo if I want. I can click on the logo, resize it, reposition it. You can edit on the canvas and have more advanced customization if you want. And then I can plug in my save program colors. You can save your brand colors. That way you're consistent with your style guide. Plug in all your text. You can even add sponsor logos if you want to. Uh, we um, offer custom font integration. And then you can save your design. So you can call this game day. And then you can publish or schedule it out to all of your linked social media accounts. You can connect as many Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram accounts as you would like and you can publish or schedule in one click. You'll see here, publish, it will go right out to all my connected accounts or schedule, and it will go out and select a day or time. And then you can also download the content, put it up on your website, on physical digital boards, 
all different types of use cases. But again, you know, that's how quick and easy it is to customize content. And hopefully this was a, a helpful introduction to Gipper. If you have any questions, I'll put my info in the chat. Um, but again, just thank you so much. And um, I hope you have a good rest of the virtual uh, conference and a good session here today. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Matt, for coming to talk to us. We appreciate it. As I'm just going to share my screen here so everyone can see. So it is now my honor, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce you to our three panelists. Uh, our first panelist, someone I have the pleasure of working side by side with every day and who's actually right down the hall from me currently, um, Emily Dorco recently wrapped up her fifth year as the Associate Athletic Director for External Relations and Senior Woman Administrator at Adelphi University. Since returning to her alma mater, the former All-American softball player has overseen all communications efforts for the Panthers, including the branding and marketing strategy for all social media platforms. In 2017 and 2019, Emily served as the media contact for the national championship winning women's lacrosse team, a program that has won nine national championships since 2004. Emily, who spent two years as a graduate assistant in the sports information office at Adelphi upon graduation, came back to Adelphi in a full-time capacity after nearly two years as the assistant AD for strategic communications at New York Institute of Technology. Our second panelist, Matt Fenton, a former varsity player, returned to Messiah in July 2018 when he was named their director of athletic communications. He graduated with his bachelor's and master's degree from Messiah and first took on year-long stints leading sports information efforts at Cairn University and Claremont Mudd Scripps following a graduate assistantship at his alma mater. A six-year member of COSIDA, Matt has been heavily involved at the COSIDA convention, serving as a panelist or moderating panels on Photoshop, hosting championship events, working efficiently, game notes, and social media strategy. He also spent three years on the Division Three Divisional Day Planning Committee from 2017 until 2020, and currently stands on COSIDA's new media committee. Our final panelist, Ali Poquette, who currently serves on the Eastcom Executive Board as its college representative, returned to Middlebury College in January 2020 as its Assistant Director of Athletic Communications after spending 18 months in the same role at Wesleyan University. A former two-year intern in the Athletic Communications Office at Middlebury, she manages all social media efforts and graphic design for the Panthers, while chairing the department's diversity, equity, and inclusion committee and serving as a SAC liaison. In addition to her role on the Eastcom Executive Board, Ali was also appointed to the COSIDA Division III Cabinet and D3 SIDA Executive Board in 2020 and serves on COSIDA's professional development and education committees. And one last note before we get started, everyone, we are looking to leave as much time as possible for a Q&A at the end. So we do ask that you please place all questions in the chat which you may do during the duration of the session, and we will try to get to them or to as many of them as we possibly can. That being said, Ali, please take it away. Awesome, thanks, Ian. Uh, it's great to be here and see so many familiar faces and also some newcomers this year. So um, I'm gonna dive right into my uh, first slide here um, of the session. So one of the biggest things with social media that all of us know is that the landscape changes every single day. And so heading into any academic year, establishing a plan is going to be your best bet at ensuring when you get into the most busy time of the year, crossover season, um, you kind of know what you're, what you're going to do. Um, that being said, it's also an area where you have to be pretty flexible, just like athletics, um, things can change on a dime. And so you know, plans are, are great, but you also have to leave room for flexibility. Uh, so when you establish a social media plan, one of the things that I um, always suggest to people is knowing the platforms that you're using and knowing your audiences. So the audiences at Middlebury on our Instagram account are going to be different audiences than Matthew's, you know, Messiah Facebook group. So knowing your audiences so that you can carry your content towards their needs is really important. And you can do that a lot of different ways. Analytics are great, um, but they don't tell you everything. So really knowing um, your audiences, being on those platforms every single day is gonna be your best bet at kind of starting to understand what's working, what's not. And again, with any plan, you may think um, a one minute video is great on Twitter and come to find out you know, it performs better on Instagram. So just always being flexible with changing your plan if something you think um, was gonna perform really well in one place doesn't. Um, and then having a plan for all types of content and talking about that as an office before you enter the school year. So something as simple as a game recap, 
uh, knowing where you're posting that. Are you posting every single game recap on Facebook? Are you putting them on Twitter? Is it a mix of both? Um, you know, how is that going to work? Feature stories, graphics, video. So every type of content that you have, having a plan for where that's going to go. And then if you have something that is pretty high level and you want to put it on maybe multiple platforms, how does that look on, on multiple platforms? You know, if it's a feature story, are you putting together a photo carousel on Instagram to promote that, but the story itself is getting posted on Facebook. So just the more you can plan ahead of time and summer is honestly the best time to do that. You can get your office together, uh, just start having those conversations of what's working well from last year, what didn't work well, and then what are some new things coming up can really um, just set you on the right path so that when it does get busy, um, you at least have a shell of a plan. So the second piece is still very similar to uh, establishing your plan, and that's creating your content calendar. So when you get together as an office, figure out what events you will be covering for the next year that you can count on. So are there expectations from your advancement or alumni relations office for you to push, uh, you know, specific fundraisers? Um, map out that calendar, you know, we, we have an actual calendar and we have written across it different weeks that come up that we plan on promoting. So having that ahead of time before you go into the school year is awesome because you can plan around those events. So um, are you going to promote COSIDA membership week? Uh, are you going to participate in diversity and inclusion week? Um, and laying out those things that you can expect. And then also outlining some of the important dates um, that you know are going to pop up every year. You know, we usually know when our conference or COSIDA awards are coming in, uh, when postseason is going to occur. So starting to look at that so you can fill in the holes when it is the beginning of the fall and you don't have a lot going on. You know, that might be a perfect place to put a feature story or a profile on an athlete. Uh, and then one of the things that we do is we're in constant communication with our coaches and filling them in on uh, what we do have coming up so that they can plan and prep their own content. We're very uh, cognizant of letting them know, hey, um, diversity and inclusion week's coming up. These are the things that we're posting. Here's the website that can take you through the expectations. And so that they really have the opportunity to do their own thing, but they also know what to plan for and they know what's going to be provided to them. Another thing that we like to do in the summer for planning is creating our own graphic template suite. So I know many people on this call use, um, you know, we just had an, an awesome uh, little segue there at the beginning, but there's a lot of different softwares out there um, that produce, you know, awesome templates. And then there's a lot of people that do them in-house. Uh, so whatever you're using, whether it's in-house or you're using a software, uh, just deciding what your overall look is going to be for the, that next year and what you're actually going to use graphics for. So we have a whole list, um, you know, player of the week, milestone graphics, all Americans. So we know that when all American comes up at the end of the season, we have a graphic template already ready for them. We know what it's going to look like. All we have to do is cut out the athlete and put their name on the graphic. Um, so just starting to kind of plan ahead with that. And one of the nice things about doing this ahead of time in the summer is that um, you know that they're all going to flow together. So you can have consistency in your brand, your fonts, um, your overlays, all of those sorts of things. So when you look at them on the screen, you can see, you know, that's a Middlebury Athletics graphic. Um, so when somebody's scrolling through their Instagram account, it's easily recognizable and it's not just a oh, we just had a player of the week and now I need to come up with this template and uh, what did we do last week? I don't remember and having to reference back. So this is something that's really helped us. Um, and again, anything you can do ahead of time in the summer to cut down the time um, that you have to put in during the school year is, is really gonna help you with the social media piece. And then the last thing that we talk about a lot here at Middlebury and I'm sure other schools is that collaboration is key for social media. It truly is a team effort. Um, we have an awesome conference office. They're always producing um, really great, you know, feature pieces. We just had um, right now is our 50th anniversary. So lots of different profiles that are going out. Um, repurposing that content is amazing. Um, they're already doing it. It's highlighting our uh, successes and achievements. Um, and being able to push those out on different uh, platforms for us has been huge. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort for us. We're really thankful that we have, you know, a conference office that produces so much. Um, so we really use that to our advantage. Uh, students are another area where you can take advantage of collaborating with. Uh, this spring, our Student Athletes of Color uh, organization approached us and asked to do some Instagram takeovers on their own account. We said, hey, 
you just started your account. You probably want some followers. Why don't you do it on our main account? Um, and so they did. And so it was great content for us. Uh, we trained them all in one group and, you know, gave them the password and off they went. Um, and it was awesome. People really responded well to it. Um, there was not a ton of planning that went into it for us. Um, and also our athletes were able to kind of take control of something and, um, they're, you know, are on the ground every single day. They're our best inside, um, into what's going on on campus. So utilizing student athletes is, is huge. Um, and then similarly to that on, on campuses, whether you're a part of the communications department or not, um, just being in touch with other social media managers for other departments, as well as your college. Uh, we have a great relationship uh, in communications with our social media strategist. So we're, we're in constant communication with him about, you know, what are big things that the college is pushing out that we should be aware of and vice versa. What are things that we're pushing out that we, you know, would want them to share about as well. Um, and then lastly, I talked about this on the last slide, but there's some amazing tools out there to help SIDs, whether you're a one person, person shop um, or you're managing 40 sports um, to kind of help you uh, cut down on the time that it takes to do things. So whether it's um, graphics softwares, or um, here's a little screenshot on the bottom of um, a social media uh, scheduling device, anything that you can use like that, that you can, um, you know, go to your AD or your boss and, and get funding for is really going to help your department. So we use a scheduling platform, we schedule out all of our content that we can ahead of time, it just makes our lives so much easier, um, being able to go in here, see what we have um, lined up for the week, or for the month, you know, we can visually say, uh, here are the gaps, here's where we need to fill in, um, and also know what's coming and be able to pause things if, say, a global pandemic happens and you have to cancel your sports season and you don't want to be putting something out um, ahead of that announcement. So just utilizing the resources that are at your fingertips and collaborating is really going to be major for um, your success in social media. And I think, Ali, I'll jump in. We talk about, uh, you talked a lot about collaboration and uh, using your on-campus student groups and obviously our student athletes. We at Adelphi took this pandemic as an opportunity to connect with our SAC executive board and our SAC reps. So really asking them in a time that we knew we weren't gonna have a ton of content readily available with game recaps and post-game stuff and awards. So we said, what do you wanna see? What can we do? So really, putting the onus on them because then that, that almost gives them the opportunity to take pride. And when they see it come to fruition, they can say, oh, I had a hand kind of in planning and being a part of this new content that we came up with. So um, like Ali said, our student athletes, obviously they're the ones that we're, we work for, we're here for. Uh, so definitely lean on them if you are struggling to come up with any uh, content ideas overall. Yeah, that, that's such a great point, Emily. And I think um, oftentimes, I think we get stuck in a way of not wanting to ask for help necessarily, but student athletes really like social media. I'm not sure if you have all noticed that, but they love to see themselves on social media and see their friends. And so it's just awesome when you can involve them in the process and, and even coaches too. I mean, we've, we've sent out questionnaires to coaches, like what graphics are helpful for your program um, to have. And so whenever you can kind of allow coaches and student athletes to feel like they're valued and they also have a voice in the process, it just goes a long way. So excellent point, Emily. Emily, do you want to start? Sure. I wasn't sure if you wanted to bop into the chat for any questions, but um, first I want to thank Ian and the East Com board for asking me to be on this panel. I think this is really fun. And I think across the board, everyone's probably going to do something a little different. So we hope that uh, everything that we talk about today, you can maybe take one little tidbit back to your uh, institution for this upcoming school year. Uh, so at Adelphi, we have, um, we're Google-based, so Gmail, Google Drive. Uh, I actually worked with our IT department to get um, what's called a shared team drive. So it's not necessarily connected to a person like myself, but it is connected to my position. So myself, Ian, our other assistant and our grad assistant all have access to this team drive. And this is where we kind of map out and, and store a lot of our archival stuff. But in addition, we put all of our stuff for the upcoming year or throughout the year. This is where we're saving uh, templates and files and um, docs that are going to benefit everyone. So when we hit the height of this pandemic and we said, okay, we need to come up with a content plan, 
I said, all right, we're going to put this in the content idea generation folder. And then within that folder, we have a breakdown of we had summer 2020, fall 2020, spring 21, summer, and now we're in summer 21 and preparing our fall 21 pieces. So it's a running list basically that has all of our ideas or things that we know we have to cover. And then it, it breaks down for those of us who have um, multiple people on staff, we have it high, color coded. So that way we know who is kind of taking the lead on what projects uh, throughout the year. So that's the right hand screenshot on this slide. And then the left hand screenshot is just a breakdown. It's probably not completed. Oh no, it's just January through September. So this is a, just a month by month breakdown of the things at Adelphi that we cover every year and we know we're going to cover. So by making this document, you're not in March looking, or thinking about May, like, oh, what it's obviously it's a crossover point of the year and thinking about, okay, what do I need to have prepped? If you write it down from the start, you have, you can look at your media days and say, okay, I need to make sure that today I'm like, if I have media day in August, I'm prepping all my stuff for Black History Month or National Student Athlete Day, or I'm throughout preseason, I'm making sure that I'm prepping for March because I know I'm going to be doing National Athletic Trainers Month. So kind of really, like Ali said, just laying it all out, stuff that you consistently cover and promote that you and across campus collaborate on, just making sure you have it in a document that you and your staff members or even your coaching staffs can reference so that way they all know what's going on as well is important to have and is a great way to get yourself prepared ahead of looking at a full school year, what you've got, what you know you have going on. So again, like Ali said, plan, 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 whatever software you are using to uh, plan your graphics. So we are Photoshop heavy here at Adelphi. And I was recently, more recently introduced to the artboard concept. Um, I'm not sure how many people on this call, maybe if, if, you use artboards or, or are familiar with artboards, maybe throw up a reaction, a thumbs up reaction, because I'd be interested to see um, how many people are actually using artboards. So this is just an uh, a piece of the software that you can really lay out each platform that you are planning for. And all of the pieces, they become smart objects. So when, you, when I change my Twitter, the name and maybe the award that's being won, it'll then connect and change it on all of the other, um, the, all the other platforms that are on your artboard. So, I mean, at the end of this, if we have time, we joked uh, when we were planning for this segment that if we need to do a, a brief artboard tutorial, we might have some time. And by no means am I an expert, I'm still probably definitely an amateur or rookie. Um, and I'm, if other people have uh, uh, suggestions, uh, I just, this made my life so much easier and so much easier for our staffs to be able to just quickly say, okay, we need, we know that we're going to plan and post an Instagram, an Instagram story and on Twitter for our end of the year awards banquet, which was last week. So what's the easiest way to lay it all out so we can see it, how it's going to cohesively look all together. So, um, like Ali said, if you use, I mean, Go Gipper, that was an awesome uh, presentation at the beginning of this. And I'm, I'm definitely gonna look into that a little bit more just because the time-saving aspect of actually having to create this artboard seems a, a little less extensive. So um, whatever works for you, I would say. And then just this last slide for me, uh, helpful tips. We have a handful of coaches in our department that um, love social media and then majority of them can't not they can't be bothered, but the day-to-day -day of it all, they probably can't be bothered with and that they've decided, oh, let me leave that up to the professionals. That is um, my office and my staff. So basically just having a conversation ahead of a season or ahead, if a new coach comes on board, um, what they want to see, what they are comfortable preparing for the social media, if they want to use their student athletes to kind of manage and run throughout the year, that's just then having us, having them have a conversation with us in terms of policies, do's and don'ts, best practices. But if your coaches are going to take the lead, um, we talk a lot about brand consistency. So sometimes if you have one team doing one thing because their coach wants to run it and then another team doing their own thing because a coach wants to run it, how are we 
how is my office going to supplement the content in between, right? So it's, it's great because our track coach, she takes um, videos at practice and at all of their meets and is able to post and she's got the records and is able to um, quickly access all of that stuff. So it's, it's our responsibility in the in-between to throw up those excellent uh, action photos that she might not have access to. So that way we're, we're giving our prospective student athletes um, a, an inside look at how awesome photog sports photography at the college, division two college level can be. Um, it, it, and it's really exciting for the student athletes themselves to see themselves on social media, obviously. Um, so this, this might be a little back and forth. Don't plan out content for the year, map out each week. So do plan your content for the year in terms of having a general idea of what you're doing, but map out um, each week. So I'm, I'm actually definitely going to connect with Allie after this and talk, talk a little bit more about that scheduling, because I think that's visually being able to see what's going out on what platforms, what from what team accounts is really important. Um, and then for us at Adelphi, each team has its own Twitter and its own Instagram account. And then a few of the teams also have Facebook. So it's really uh, constantly talking about, okay, what's going out on what account, where, what's the priority, is the information, does it need to go on the main account before it goes on a team account, X, Y, Z, kind of talking about all of those things with your staff before you kind of head into a school year. And then the last thing, be realis realistic in what you can sustain. So when I first graduated at Delphi and I went to New York Tech, I was a uh, one woman SID shop, 13 sports, one division one uh, baseball program. And I wanted to hit the ground running and I wanted to do it all. And I spoke with some colleagues and uh, former bosses of mine. And they said, but think about when you get to the height of crossover season and you wanna do all these things, are you going to really be able to do all of those things the way you want to do them? to the best of your ability. So I had to take a step back and my brain had to pause for a second and say, all right, yeah, no, like if I start a podcast and I've got all these great um, trivia questions throughout the, the year, but then I've got five games in four days and playoffs upcoming, am I really gonna have time to think about maybe the not the less important things? So at a slower time, obviously in the summer, that that's definitely some things that you can incorporate, but once, once we're at the height of uh, our seasons, is it really worth it? Because then you don't wanna be putting out, not crappy content, but you don't wanna be putting out subpar um, graphics or whatnot and, and not love them. I'm a big thing of, I have to love it before I post it. If I don't love it, I'm probably not, I'm probably gonna pull the plug on it. So um, I hope all of those tips help you as you move into the fall semester. Thank you, Emily. And uh, I, I don't want anyone to forget that we're um, that we're not getting to the chat. We want to get to that at the end, but now we're just going to head over to Matt. Sure. Um, thanks, everybody. I, you know, I'll echo the words that Ali and Emily said uh, to get underway. Big honor to be here and, and be able to share a little bit about what we do uh, here at Messiah. When I think about presenting at um, usually when we're in a big room, but when I think about presenting uh, over Zoom, I think of this as more of a case study more than anything. So sharing a little bit about what we do, it's not a one size fits all model uh, by any means. And I think when we were starting the planning, we were looking at what our departments looked like um, at Middlebury, at Adelphi and at Messiah, all very different, all different resourcing from a personnel standpoint, from uh, an equipment standpoint, standpoint et cetera. So when I think about it, I want to give a little context of what we're working with uh, here at Messiah. And so um, I'm the only full-time member of our department, uh, but I do have two grad assistants and a handful of interns here and there. So uh, I have a, a year one GA and a year two GA, and they kind of help train each other in different ways. Uh, but I'm the only full-time member. And so for us, what's important, uh, you see it here on your screen, we, we kind of came up with what's a coverage policy. So when I think about a different type of event, um, and if you see the, the words kind of turned sideways there, there are regular season away games, regular season home, uh, a conference playoff home, conference playoff away, NCAA tournament home and away as well. Um, we kind of went through and said, what's, what do we do for these? We're creating, you know, what, what's the norm? What, what's standard issue um, for each of these different types of events? And they look a little bit different. You know, sure, those grade in boxes there. I think there's four or five things that we do for everything. 
Uh, and that kind of you know sets the tone of what we're doing on social. And so, yes, we're writing an article for our website. Yes, we're doing a post-game score, um, Instagram post, and we're doing an XML box score and things like that for everything. Um, but coverage is going to look different depending on the different type of events. And so for us, having a standard and having something that is you know, the way that we do things and the way that we present um, for a different type of event is really helpful and really important for my team whether it's myself or grad assistants to know, all right, hey, this is the game that's coming up. This is how we need to prepare. This is what needs to happen pre-game. This is what needs to happen post-game as well as during the game. And so, you know, creating that established plan that helps our team run and be on the same page. And so if I said, hey, we need our video board graphics, you know, we know which events that we need them for. It's the home events. We don't care about the away stuff for video board. Um, and depending on what sports in, at home and, and what arena is where we need to be focusing. So you can take a look at that chart. Um, again, it's not the one size fits all. I think it's you know, different depending on what's important. Um, but for us, this is where we land. Uh, and so you see on the far right in NCAA home tournament event, we have X's going down through pretty much everything, um, which is fun and exciting, but obviously is more work. So it's, it's how do we portion that out? Um, and, and be able to handle that, but also know what it is um, that a month like November for us is busy because uh, our fall sports are relatively competitive. Um, how do we handle these busy seasons? Um, and I think being able to look at this and say, this is what needs to happen for a soccer NCAA tournament game at home versus a, a men's basketball tip-off tournament um, that we maybe don't care as much about. Uh, at least in that moment. So uh, all about having a plan and, and being able to communicate that uh, with your crew. Um, before we slide over the next slide, this is kind of what pre-2020 looked like for us. Um, the way I kind of approached my little segment here this afternoon uh, was to give kind of what pre-2020, pre-COVID looked like, uh, a little look at what COVID did to our department and how we adapted and how we changed uh, and then on the back end, what are ways that we have fundamentally changed from this existing model that we had, you know, a year and a half, two years ago? Um, so we can jump to the next slide. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the impact of COVID. And so I think as we all experienced, COVID was different and changed the way that we had to operate. You know, we didn't have our traditional contests going on in the fall. Uh, we played everything in the spring. Um, and so really this is focused on our fall of 2020. Um, we had to think outside the box. And so for us, what we did at Messiah, everybody came in um, end of August, early September, and we brainstormed. We, you know, we sat down and we said, all right, let's get all the ideas out there. How can we create content um, and, and create these almost series um, for our content pieces over the course of the fall? And we threw probably 20 to 30 ideas out there. Um, some were good, some were terrible. Um, and we picked and chose and we said, all right, let's put them into buckets. You know, what, what are things that we can do weekly? What are things we can do biweekly? And what are things we can do monthly? And we looked just at the fall semester. Uh, we kind of knew we weren't going to be playing sports. And so from a weekly standpoint, we needed probably 15 to 20 pieces of content bi-weekly probably seven to ten and monthly three to four and and that was a really helpful lens for us to look through and say can we do this 15 times uh can, can we put out a quality product 15 times and if the answer was no then we kind of moved it down to bi-weekly we said we, we can do it really well seven to ten times this semester but maybe not 15 to 20 and so when we looked through that lens we kind of sifted it all out and we had I want to say about a dozen different series that we did. Um, five of them we did weekly. We, we had five different things. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that we said we can do this 20 times. We can confidently say we can do these five series 20 times um, and then some biweekly and some monthly pieces after that. And so when we looked through that lens, it was helpful to just see, you know, as Emily described, putting together a calendar saying we don't just want to do this well once. We want to do this well all the time. Um, that was super important to us. And looking at it through that lens, we kind of got to that point. Um, and we were leveraging social media very heavily during that fall. Uh, and so what we did was, maybe uh, some might not like this, but uh, I don't like the scrolling um, piece on a website when a story goes up and then slides away. So we recently had redone our website and it had kind of a mosaic look. Um, and so what we did was we took over the homepage for the fall. Um, took away all of our stories and created different stories that fit into a larger mosaic piece um, that fans could click on 
and go into a series. Uh, you see some of our series up there, um, staff shout outs or um, Instagram takeovers or Friday Falcon facts um, and some different pieces. And we took all those social pieces and we put them into a story um, using our sidearm narrator piece, uh, which was super helpful. Um, and we're able to just put everything in one spot so we could leverage it on social media as well as on our website. Um, because we're a lean team, we weren't doing different content for our website as well as social. We just kind of you know, made it a little bit of dual purpose, but um, we're able to have impact on our website as well. So um, that was kind of what we did. I don't have a screenshot, unfortunately, of what our website looked like for that, um, but I thought it looked pretty cool. We can jump to our next slide. Um, and so thinking about what post-COVID world looks like for athletic communications at Messiah, um, we sat down and, and had sports getting started back up in end of January, early February for us. Um, and we said, okay, people kind of forget what the norm looks like um, on Messiah sports uh, on social media. So we can kind of take this as an opportunity to rebrand ourselves a little bit. And so um, previously, if we go, we don't need to go back two slides, but if you go back to that original listing of all of these different pieces that we did, um, whether it's a highlight of the night or photo of the night or post-game score graphic or special awards, graphics, things like that, we would post all of those separately, um, particularly on Instagram. And our Instagram feed would get bogged down like crazy. You'd have maybe 20 posts in a night. Uh, which I hated, but I didn't know how to get out of this situation. So where we landed um, was putting them into a bundle post uh, is what we call it. So just like the progressive commercial, we're, we're bundling our posts uh, and saving you time and money uh, if you're following us on Messiah Sports. And so uh, we create everything to the same size. Uh, so on Instagram specifically, each event would have just one post and it would have their game score graphic on top. And you would swipe and you would have your highlight of the night and you'd swipe and go through pictures of the event. Um, and so in that way, there's pros and cons to it. Um, I think we're probably going to reevaluate exactly what we're doing heading into the fall. Um, but overall, I liked it. I, I thought it was an easy way to only have maybe five posts a day on Instagram instead of 20 posts a day. And so scaling that back a little bit, bundling them, you can't get them up as fast. Uh, but I think if I'm a viewer, I want to see one thing I can scroll through and say, oh, I know everything that happened in the swim meet or everything that happened in softball today, rather than hunting and going through and, and looking through a whole bunch of different pieces of content. So that was how we adapted. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, best case scenario or anything like that. Um, but again, case study, this is what we did here at Messiah. So um, if you want to jump to the next slide, I think I have a couple of concluding thoughts. Um, so for me, the COVID opportunity gave us, I say opportunity, I don't think it was a bad thing. I think it was um, an opportunity to rebrand, an opportunity to think critically about what we're doing. Um, I don't have it on here necessarily, but we thought a lot about what was high impact versus what was high importance. Um, and, and sometimes those two things are in drastically different directions, um, which is tough because they're both important because we want to do the high impact pieces. Um, of our world and what are bringing followers in, what do our student athletes care about, what do our fans care about, um, but they're not always the high important, high importance pieces. And I think social media is like that in a lot of different ways. Um, when we think about, you know, high importance is probably getting your stats right and putting an article out of some sort and um, taking care of your fellow SID um, for an event. High impact is always the video and the graphics and things like that. And so finding ways that we could do the two of those well together. Um, I think COVID, COVID gave us an opportunity to really think critically about what we're doing and how we can do it better. Um, and so I always think about high impact, high importance, um, and kind of where we fall on different sides of those pieces. Um, and I think following along very similarly to uh, what Emily said earlier, I always ask myself two questions. Um, one is, can we do this really well? Uh, and two is, can we do this really well all the time? That second part, very important, um, because I think in, in a moment we can say, yes, we can do this super well. We, we can knock this out of the park and have the best highlight videos around uh, with sideline footage and all that stuff. But we don't have the personnel. We don't have the resources to do that for every conference championship game. Just that one day where there's nothing else going on. And so 
um, finding a, a middle ground again, how to make high importance, high impact, but also do things with excellence all the time. Uh, and so the answer is to no is that we just need to reevaluate kind of what we're looking at, what we're doing, what can be sustainable looking long term. Um, and I think that's important to us. Um, but I think using COVID as a chance to reinvent and, and re-impact and refocus your department, um, super interesting. I know everybody on this call, all 70 of you, uh, I'm sure is doing that right now. Um, but I think it was great going into the spring to have that as a kind of a launching pad. And now again, this summer to say, hey, what we did in the spring, was that good? Was that bad? People don't really remember it. it was a weird year anyway. Uh, and so how can we kind of change it back around um, and, and move forward? So those are some of my thoughts on what we did here at Messiah. Um, obviously, I'd love to hear what everybody else is doing. Um, or if there's any questions on, uh, on what we're doing, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Ian to, to maybe take us home here. Thanks a lot, man. We appreciate your input and in telling us your story um, at Messiah. Um, thanks again to all three of our panelists. We'd now like to dive into the Q&A portion. Um, and I'll, we have a couple of questions here, uh, a couple of which have already been answered. But first, we'll start with a, uh, a question from, uh, from our conference, actually from Ben Stockwell at the NE10. And this is, how do you all deal with coaches or administrators who don't seem to fully respect those two questions that Matt is talking about in terms of how do you know, can we do this well? Can we do it well all the time? Doesn't matter who jumps in. No. <laughs> yeah, Ben, I mean, every one of our coaches, I mean, I give them, I, I tell them sit with your SID if there's, if you have expectations and if you, if there's things that you want done, you just need to have a conversation. And then I feel, I feel like we prep our staff good enough to say, to let them know that you just have to understand I've got all of these things. I have no problem saying, no, I'm, I can't do a post-game highlight video within 10 minutes of the game ending because I've got to wrap up stats. I have to care about my, my fellow SID. I need to make sure that the photographer is uploading pictures. If we had a photographer that game, I need to make sure that all of my stuff, my stuff becomes a priority because it's that's the primary focus of my job. So really just, I think open, honest, transparency conversations are really great to have with coaches and to have them before you get fully into a season. I'll tag along to that a little bit. I, I think that's really hard, right? I, I think those are areas where sports information profession can be underappreciated in, in some areas because folks see, you know, they, they have the blinders, you know, they, they see what you're doing for their program. And they don't see the 21 other programs that you're working with. Um, and so I think it can be a really delicate conversation, but I think what Emily's saying is try to get in front of that as much as you can um, and, and set expectations and, for me, that's if someone's looking for something and they're like, hey, we need those senior day posts turned around by you know, Thursday and it's Tuesday. Um, I'm learning. I'm not good at this. I'm, I'm very quick to say yes. Um, but I'm learning to say, man, I wish I could. If you would have given me three weeks, we would have had those done. That would have been <laughs> awesome. Um, not necessarily a no, but it's a, hey, I can't wait to do that next year if you give us more time. Uh, or find a middle ground and say, we can do that really well all the time if we have this window. Um, but if we have a shorter window, it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, I sympathize. I am terrible at pushing back and, and saying no. Um, but I think finding small ways to look forward and say, what, what would I need on a project like this? This is how we can turn around and get it to you. Join, join the club there, Matt. <laughs> I'm being a yes man. <laughs> I think tagging a, on to that too is the, the not necessarily it's a yes or a no. Um, sometimes it's a no, not, I can't do it right now because it's crossover season. Um, but this non-time sensitive thing I can do in two weeks. Um, so I think that just kind of loops back to what Emily said as well, like the clear communication and setting those expectations. Um, and then I mentioned this earlier, but involving your coaches in some of your processes to get feedback can be really beneficial as long as they know that not everything they suggest will be uh, done. But when you involve them and then they see some of their suggestions take place, they feel heard and seen and like you do care about their program and you are invested. And so that can go like a really long way. So when you do get in a situation where you have to say like, I really can't, it's crossover. We just do not have the capacity to do that. They're more, much more understanding I've found um, because they also know that you're making an effort to like do some of those things they've suggested and take some of that extra time. So I think it's a 
it doesn't have to always just be a yes or a no. It can be a yes and a no and, or just that conversation sometimes is all you need for them to understand. Our next question here is from Adam. And I know this is something that we haven't started using yet. Emily or I haven't started using yet at Adelphi. I'm not sure at uh, Middlebury or Messiah, but the question is, um, as new social media platforms begin to grow as an example, TikTok, uh, what advice would you give for those who want to take advantage of the new platforms and the hot market, but do not want to give up the platforms that have consistently done well over the years vis-a-vis -vis Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram? I'm happy to jump in first. <laughs> I, had a, I had an intern who was very gung-ho about uh, a Messiah TikTok account. Um, and we, we put it on the table. We had a, a nice lengthy discussion and ultimately landed on, can we do this well all the time? You know, I, I think figuring out what are, what's the goal, what's the purpose, you know, obviously TikTok is going to be different. Um, and his, his counter argument was, oh, we want to go viral. We want to go viral. Oh, it'd be awesome. Highlight plays go viral. Like we, we don't have highlight plays that are going to go viral M maybe once a year, but, but not in a way to be able to do this well all the time. And so we ended up asking the question, hey, what scale one to 10, what, what would be the impact of this? And scale one to 10, how sustainable would this be? And I, I turned it back around on him and we had a good healthy dialogue and, you know, kind of around the room, we landed in like the three or four range on high impact. And so uh, we said, no, not yet. You know, I know Messiah has tried to do Snapchat back five or six years ago before I got here. And I squashed that one as soon as I came. I said that just uh, was outside of my realm of uh, expertise and not something I think we could do well all the time. And so it just wasn't going to work for us. Ian, you might not actually know this, but before you got here, we did have a Snapchat and we were, I think I was, I was probably in grad school. So um, phased out a little bit, but when I always get the student athletes always ask, Oh, why don't you post on Snapchat anymore? Why don't, why aren't you on Snapchat? I'm like, well, I, for me, I can't see the quantitative reach that I'm getting, right? So once Instagram stories became a big thing and I could see how many people were looking at our Instagram stories, I was like, oh, I don't even need to bother with Snapchat because I'm not getting any feedback from that, right? You're not able to tell how many eyeballs are actually seeing your content if you post on Snapchat. And um, so that's, that's a little tidbit Ian might not know. We had one, but we don't have it anymore because it's the, the quantitative aspect of it is, is important. Yeah, and I think one thing too, when new platforms come out is everyone kind of wants to like jump on that bandwagon of like, oh, these, you know, major division one or professional leagues are doing this. So we have to do it. Sometimes it's actually nice to sit back and see like, how are they actually using it? Because we've seen a lot of apps, um, you know, I can think of like Vine or maybe MySpace um, that have fizzled out and would not be useful for our jobs. Um, and so sometimes it's not necessarily not doing it. It's just kind of seeing like, what are other schools doing? How are they making it work? And, and will it really be impactful? And would it be more impactful than something we are currently using? And if yes is the answer, then maybe it's not a, we're adding this in. Um, maybe it's a Snapchat no longer serves us, but TikTok does. Um, and so I think those conversations and, um, but again, I think it always goes back to, at least for us, like, is it sustainable? And when you have student athletes who are really uh, high energy and they wanna try things, piloting things with them is also, you know, something you can do. We're going to try this out for the semester, see how it goes. If it's sustainable and we can build out a plan for this year round, even once you graduate, great. If we try it out and it's like, mm, didn't really work. I mean, that's okay too. It's okay to fail or not have something, you know, be as successful as something else. That's how you figure out what works best for your school. So I think it's a, a hybrid approach and a mix and um, yeah, just not being afraid to see it fail. I know we were not running up against any other panels, so we're going to try and get a few more questions in here. Um, our next question, Emily, I'm going to point this question to you, um, just because I know this is something that we deal with every day here at Adelphi. Um, how do you determine the balance between posting content on the main accounts versus those that are team specific? So what is a reasonable, reasonable volume of posts to each on, on a daily, weekly basis? And do you always look for ways to grow bo both platforms? 
And this is a, a, a good question and it's a lot of parts. And I think that's why we, that's why the planning of it is so important. So we say, you're gonna have your content for the year, that's great, but it's really important to look at week to week what you've got going on. And I know it can get crazy when conference offices have something going at noon and something else that you had already planned is going at two o'clock. So um, based on the, I don't want to say priority because we every day, every every one of our student athlete accomplishments or anything that we're sharing is important. So it's it's conversations with amongst your staff if you have one, and um, maybe with a coach. It's it's hey, this is going and it's it's a little bit more high priority. So we're going to push it to your team account first, and we'll be able to get whatever we posted on that team account. Maybe it's not the same graphic. Maybe it's just an action photo. We'll get that on the main account sometime later in the week. So it's really just making the decision. And like Ali kind of talked about, what does your audience want to see? So if if I'm a softball, well, I am a softball alum. I'm a softball alum. So when I go to the softball account, I'm really, in, or I, I see something, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Um, I wonder if they're going to, and it's just because I'm in the, in the biz, um, I, I go to the main account for the school as well to see if it's getting the same amount of love. And, and that might just be me, but I know that my teammates, some of my alumni teammates, they don't follow the main account. They just follow the softball account. So it's important to hit both of those platforms or both of those uh, accounts separately because of the different audiences. And I think we get a lot of love from parents on our main account because we're when we post on the team accounts, we reshare on the Instagram stories from the main account. So then, oh, my kid's also on this account. Let me click on this. And oh, I didn't even know this existed. Let me follow them. So um, I hope that somewhat answered the question. I, I, it's really conversation and just deciding what's, what's priority and making it all work. And I can follow up on the following question there by Bill Morgel, just regarding you know a recommended time of day to to post because I know here at Adelphi, um, you know, we try not to, and, and this was part of what Emily was referring to during um, on her part of the session uh, about trying not to overcrowd your social media accounts. Um, trying, you know, if there's something like I think as SIDs, we become so used to or formed to trying to get if COSIDA Academic All District is coming out this day and soccer awards are coming out, you know, at two o'clock and, you know, all regional awards are coming out at five. Let's try and get everything out. Don't be afraid to push something to the next day. Um, you know, in the end, you're, you're really tuning it to your audience, not really so much the national audience. And on top of that, um, it's, it's, I think it's just important to have that breakup. And we found at least from, you know, from my experiences here that uh, we usually do, most of our posts usually go around either around 11 to 12, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. or, and then usually do a post around three or four o'clock. Um, we usually don't try to overcrowd unless there is some time sensitive information uh, that has to go out there, Bill. So I, I'll leave it also here to Ali and uh, to Matt to add in anything else. Yeah, I think time of day is tricky, uh, but we definitely use the analytics to determine like how successful certain times of day are. Um, you know, most people that work a standard nine to five job, they're probably checking things first thing in the morning at lunch and then once they're home. So those are always good, like kind of general times to think about when you're posting. Um, anytime after five is always going to do really well. Um, if you think about yourself sitting on the couch at night or in bed and you're just scrolling, like those are the, that's the time of day where people are most active on social media nationally and generally that's not like specific to our audience um so i think like those are definitely um times to be aware of but um you know it's hard to kind of schedule within those windows when you're also you know trying to fit in postseason and awards and then your conference office comes out with something that you didn't know and all of those different things start to compound each other so um that's like a loose guideline but yeah i think the if you think about yourself as a user and when you're most often on social media, it's when you're not at work or taking a break from work. So that's when most people are, are scrolling through and um, you can have probably the biggest reach. Let's get to a couple more questions here. We have a question from, uh, from Derek Dunning, which is any tips or strategies around leveraging content around the new Instagram algorithm? Organic reach and impressions seem to have really taken a hit the last couple of months. I have no idea. I, I saw, I saw Ali. I, I saw Ali kind of smiling at it. So I was going to lead with her there. Uh, I was just smiling because I'm honestly still trying to figure it out. I mean, the new algorithm is um, annoying. 
uh, if I could sum it up in one word. So I don't have a perfect answer for that. And I think it's like anything new, whether it's an algorithm or a platform, it's going to take a little time for us to like really dive into um, why we're seeing these trends. Like, you know, as Derek mentioned, like the organic reach is definitely, uh, I wouldn't say plummeting, but it's definitely taking a hit. And so um, I don't have any suggestions right now. I'm just kind of trying to like track it and see I don't know what we might do for the fall to kind of get things back up, but yeah, it's a great question. Sorry. I don't have a better answer. But I think in the time that we are trying to figure it out, perhaps just remaining consistent, um, not like taking a day off or, or, or adjusting like a few days in a row, maybe try and stay consistent a little bit, see if it changes. Maybe I would say probably three, four weeks. And if it doesn't maybe alter just very uh, minimally, uh, to see if it's changing. So um, I don't think one, making a change on one day and then maybe going back to the same thing is, is you're really gonna see a difference. But um, I think kind of keeping the consistency in check is important. I think something that we all have, and this is gonna to refer to Ann King's question, and thank you for sending it. Um, how do you kill a platform when you move away from it? I think I said that, so I'll take the first uh, stab at it, uh, pun intended. I, I think um, it's a hard one. We, we had a Snapchat account, as I mentioned, and I, I came on board and I just didn't post to it. Uh, I think maybe Snapchat was one that was maybe a little different than others. Um, Facebook, in some ways, is just a platform that doesn't do as well for us. Um, and so I've been kind of weaning ourselves off of posting on there all the time. Um, it's not a, a great recipe for success. I've gotten a couple of angry parents telling us that we don't um, post about our teams ever, uh, which I think is comical um, because they're just not looking for it in the right place. And, and, but I, I don't know if there's a good answer to, to, how to how to stop using a platform in a good way. I would love to look at my other panelists here and see if they have a better answer other than stop using it. I, I was just gonna say, I don't think I've ever successfully killed off um, except for just stop using it. But I think uh, if, if you are going to move away from a platform before you do, or as you gradually do, make sure that people know where they can access the information they're looking for. Like, hey, we're gonna be taking a break from Facebook or we're not gonna be posting on Facebook as much, but make sure you visit um, aupanthers.com or follow us on Twitter, or follow us on Instagram. So giving them the opportunity to know where they can find out the information that they might be looking for. Yeah, I would agree. That was the only other thing I thought about. Uh, I know last year when I got furloughed, I posted and just said, hey, we're not gonna be posting content this summer. Um, there's nobody working. We didn't say that, but you know, here, you know, expect us to be back here in a couple months. Um, again, good, not great answer, but. I have one last question here for our panelists before we wrap up, and it's, it's, it's a bit of a two-part question. Is, is there a certain amount that you try to find yourself posting a day or per week? And also, what do you find to be your most valuable social media asset? Is it Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and why? Because do you see yourself putting more resources into one social media account more Yeah, I can jump in here in terms of platforms being valuable. I think they're valuable in their own ways. We have a ton of alums that are super engaged on Facebook that are not following us on Twitter and probably aren't even on tw uh, Twitter or Instagram for that matter. Um, so I think the valuable piece for us is who are we trying to reach on each platform? And for us on Facebook, it's our alums and our parents. It's our older alums and our parents. That is our most active group. They want to see their kids. They want to be connected with the al alma mater. Um, that's by far, you know, Instagram current students, that's the biggest group perspective students. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say like there's, I mean, I personally have a platform that I love using more than others, but I think that they're both, they're all valuable in their own ways um, for us. And it's just figuring out how to reach those different audiences on those different platforms in the ways that they want to consume the information or the media. So um, I think, yeah, that would be my, my thought on that. For us, um, I, I've kind of looked at it and said Instagram um, is per personally kind of the sweet spot for us um, between 
current students, recent alums, some of our parents are sneaking on to Instagram, um, as well as prospective students. And I, I think the opportunity to use stories, um, it's also where we have our biggest following. Um, so for us, having around 6,000 followers on Instagram versus a couple thousand on other platforms, uh, it seems like the natural place for us to focus our, our efforts um, because we can use stories and leverage that as well as posts that are on there. Um, for me, um, personally, I just like the canvas element of being able to create a graphic or use that as a, as a picture platform. So uh, I'm a big fan of Instagram. I think it serves a bunch of purposes for us. And I think I'd say the same as uh, both my fellow panelists said, um, finding out what your audience wants to consume on what platforms is the easiest way to then decide how you can delegate your uh, your resources or allocate your resources to each one. And um, if you ever find yourself in a rut, I mean, I know probably right as we start COVID or started COVID and, and we were like, all right, what, well, what kind of content are we gonna push? We know we're not gonna have games. Um, throw a poll up. How are you gonna consume this information? What do you wanna see on here? How can we make this platform the best it can be in this time where we know we're not gonna have games? Um, so obviously that's not, that wouldn't be the case as we move forward into a normal um, fall. But even if you do find yourself in a content rut, just saying, hey, what can we show you? What, what do you wanna see that you haven't seen from us before? Um, Well, thank you one more time to our three panelists, to Emily, Matt, and Ali. Thank you so much for coming on and joining us here today for our panel on social media planning. And most importantly, to everyone that viewed, we hope that you found this session helpful and educational. That being said, please feel free to contact um, our panelists or myself at any time with any questions that you may have. Uh, this will conclude the first day of panels for the 2021 EastCom Virtual Convention. Please be sure to return tonight at 7 p.m. for the annual Wally World. And Ryan Yanishek Charity Raffle. Our first panel tomorrow will be at 10.30 a.m. on best practices in video, writing, and handling the workload in the profession. We thank everyone for attending today, and please have a great rest of your day.